Well, at four o'clock in the afternoon, we were winding down a mountain of dreary and desolate lava to the sea and closing our pleasant land journey. This lava is the accumulation of ages. One torrent of fire after another has rolled down here in old times and built up the island structure higher and higher. Underneath, it is honeycombed with caves. It would be of no use to dig wells in such a place. They would not hold water. You could not find any for them to hold, for that matter. Consequently, the planters depend upon cisterns. The last lava flow occurred here so long ago that there are none now living who witnessed it. In one place it enclosed and burnt down a grove of coconut trees, and the holes in the lava where the trunks stood are still visible. Their sides retain the impression of the bark. The trees fell upon a burning river, and becoming partly submerged, left it in perfect counterpart of every knot and branch and leaf, and even nut, for curiosity seekers of a long distance day to gaze upon and wonder at. There were doubtless plenty of Kanaka sentinels on guard hereabouts at the time, but they did not leave casts of their figures in the lava as the Roman sentinels at Herculaneum and Pompeii did. It is a pity it's so, because such things are so interesting. But so it is. They probably went away. They went away early, perhaps. However, they had their merits. The Romans exhibited the higher pluck, but the Kanakas showed the sounder judgment. Shortly, we came in sight of that spot whose history is so familiar to every schoolboy in the wide world, the Kealakekoa, Kealakekoa Bay, the place where Captain Cook, the great circumnavigator, was killed by the natives nearly a hundred years ago. The setting sun was flaming upon it, a summer shower was falling, and it was spanned by two magnificent rainbows. Two men who were in advance of us rode through one of these, and for the moment their garments shone with a more than regal splendor. Why did not Captain Cook have taste enough to call his great discovery the Rainbow Islands? These charming spectacles are present to you at every turn. They are common in all the islands, and they are visible every day and frequently at night also. Not the silvery bow we see once in an age in the States by moonlight, but barred with all bright and beautiful colors, like the children of the sun and rain. I saw one of them a few nights ago, what the sailors call rain dogs, little patches of rainbow, are often seen drifting about in the heavens in these latitudes, like stained cathedral windows. Kealakekoa Bay is a little curve, like the last kink of a snail shell, winding deep into the land, seemingly not more than a mile wide from shore to shore. It is bounded on one side, where the murder was done, by a little flat plain on which stands a coconut grove, and some ruined houses. A steep wall of lava, a thousand feet high at the upper end and three or four hundred at the lower, comes down from the mountain and bounds the inner extremity of it. From this wall the place takes its name, Kealakekoa, which in a native tongue signifies the pathway of the gods. They say and still believe, in spite of their liberal education and Christianity, that the great god Lono, who used to live upon the hillside, always traveled the causeway when urgent business connected him with heavenly affairs and called him down to the seashore in a hurry. As the red sun looked across the placid ocean through the tall, clean stems of the coconut trees like a blooming whiskey bloat through the bars of a city prison, 
I went and stood at the edge of the water on the flat rock pressed by Captain Cook's feet when the blow was dealt which took away his life, and tried to picture in my mind the doomed man struggling in the midst of the multitude of exasperated savages, the men in the ships crowding to the vessel's side and gazing in anxious dismay towards the shore. The, but I discovered that I could not do it. It was growing dark. The rain began to fall. We could see that the distant boomerang was helplessly becalmed at sea, and so I adjourned to the cheerless little box of a warehouse and sat down to smoke and think and wish the ship would make the land, for we had not eaten much for ten hours and were viciously hungry. Plain, unvarnished history takes the romance out of Captain Cook's assassination and renders a deliberate verdict of justifiable homicide. Wherever he went among the islands, he was cordially received and welcomed by the inhabitants, and his ships were lavishly supplied with all manner of food. He returned these kindnesses with insult and ill treatment. Perceiving that the people took him for the long-vanished and lamented god Lono, he encouraged them in this delusion for the sake of the limitless power it gave him. But during the famous disturbance at this spot, and while he and his comrades were surrounded by fifteen thousand maddened savages, he received a hurt, and betrayed his earthly origin with a groan. It was his death warrant. Instantly a shout went up. He groans. He is not a god. So they closed in upon him and dispatched him. His flesh was stripped from the bones and burned, except nine pounds of it which were sent on board the ships. The heart was hung up in a native hut, where it was found and eaten by three children who mistook it for the heart of a dog. One of these children grew up to be a very old man and died in Honolulu a few years ago. Some of Cook's bones were recovered and consigned to the deep by the officers of the ship. Small blame should attach to the natives for the killing of Cook. They treated him well. In return, he abused them. He and his men inflicted bodily injury upon many of them at different times, and killed at least three of them before they offered any proportionate retaliation. Near the shore we found Cook's monument, only a coconut stump, four feet high and about a foot in diameter at the butt. It had lava boulders piled around its base to hold it up and keep it in its place, and was entirely sheathed over from top to bottom with rough, discolored sheets of copper, such as ships' bottoms are coppered with. Each sheet had a rude inscription scratched upon it with a nail, apparently, and in every case the execution was wretched. Most of these merely recorded the visits of British naval commanders to the spot, but one of them bore this legend. Near this spot fell Captain James Cook, the distinguished circumnavigator who discovered these islands A.D. 1778. After Cook's murder, his second in command on board the ship opened fire upon the swarms of natives on the beach, and one of his cannonballs cut this coca that tree short off and left this monumental stump standing. It looked sad and lonely enough to us out there in the rainy twilight. But there's no other monument to Captain Cook. True, up on the mountain side, we had passed by a large enclosure like an ample hog pen built of lava blocks, which marks the spot where Cook's flesh was stripped from his bones and burned. But this is not properly a monument, since it was erected by the natives themselves. And less to do honor to the circumnavigator than for the sake of convenience in roasting him. A thing like a guide-board was elevated above this pen on a tall pole, and 
Formerly there was an inscription upon it describing the memorable occurrence that had taken place, but the sun and the wind had long ago so defaced it as to render it illegible. Toward midnight a fine breeze sprang up, and the schooner soon worked herself into the bay and cast anchor. The boat came ashore for us, and in a little while the clouds and the rain were all gone. The moon was beaming tranquilly down on land and sea, and we too were stretched upon the deck, sleeping the refreshing sleep and dreaming the happy dreams that are only vouchsafed to the weary and the innocent. <laughs> 